Good evening. This evening we're going to explore the spiritual developments and motivations behind the push for a one world government. Uh, many of us who are following the news, we can see all around us the pieces coming together to create a global government, one government over all of the world. But what many people are not aware of is that there is a spiritual thrust behind this as well. We're not only looking at a world government coming together, but also a world religion, or at least a type of interfaithism coming together gradually of the world's religions into one kind of system. And this is the area that I would like to address uh, this evening. Uh, for the risk of, at the risk of oversimplifying, uh, I have broken down the motivations behind the One World Movement into five different categories. And you could probably create more motivating factors, but they'd probably all fall into one of these five categories. Quickly, the first is political. I think some people pushing uh, the One World uh, Government agenda uh, are doing so for political reasons because they believe if they help to bring it about, it will guarantee them some kind of position of leadership in this world government once it's formed. And that makes sense. Um, the second motivation is economic. And this applies to some of the world's bankers, leaders of major foundations that are helping to fund much of this push. And I personally believe many of them see themselves in a very strategic financial position in the world government once it comes into play if they help to promote it now. At least they think they'll be playing a main role and will be able to benefit from this world government financially in some way. The third motivating factor is naivety. Many, many well-meaning, well-intended people who simply want world peace, they want to deal with the environmental situation and help heal the planet, and oftentimes without studying organizations first, they become involved in them and go by everything that is told them at the meetings on the surface without digging into what the organization is all about. In fact, we know of people, uh, very fine Christian people, who have given money to an organization that is actually very new age. It's tied in with the environmental movement. They had no idea until I shared with them. And that's their fault. They should have looked into that, but many people don't. So we can't judge all the people involved in this movement and say they're part of a conspiracy knowingly to create one world government, one, religion, one world religion. Many of them, a pretty high percentage of them, I believe are naively involved. I'd hate to put a percentage on it, but my guess would be possibly as many as, as uh, 20%, maybe even 30% of the people in this, in this broader movement uh, on the fringes of it. The fourth motivating factor... And here's where we really begin to get into the spiritual side of this, is Luciferianism or outright Satanism. A small percentage of the people pushing this one world, one world religion agenda are Luciferians. They believe that Lucifer is the god of light and that Adonai, the god of the Christians, is the god of darkness. They flip things around. And they believe that if they can help bring about this world government, that Lucifer's representative will take his seat on the throne and will be able to rule the world and bring us into a new golden era, which they call the New Age or the New World Order uh, and a lot of other uh, names, the Age of Aquarius as well. Um, some of the leaders of today's New Age movement were, in fact, tightly associated with the teachings of Lucifer. Alice Bailey, have any of you heard of her name? She today is referred to as the mother of the New Age movement. In 1922, she founded Lucifer Publishing Company. And in Exhibit C in my book, The New World Religion, we have a copy of a title page that came out of one of her first books. And at the bottom, it says Lucifer Publishing Company, 135 Broadway, New York City. Now that's significant because within two years, she changed the name of the organization to Lucis Trust. So most people aren't aware that Lucis Trust today was actually founded under the name Lucifer uh, Publishing Company. Alice Bailey wrote many of the occult classics read today and that are available in many of your New Age bookstores, many non, even many non-New Age bookstores in the New Age section. Also, uh, one of the leaders of the Theosophical Society, in fact, the founder of that organization, which has been so instrumental and still is today in, in the development of the New Age movement, Helena Blavatsky, she published for many years a magazine called Lucifer Magazine. And we also have a, a copy of a, a front page of magazine uh, reproduced uh, in my book in Exhibit A. Uh, I just want you to know that I'm not making these things up. As hard as this is to believe, it's really taking place. There are people out there with great influence 
who are associated with the teachings and ideals of, of Lucifer. Alice Bailey actually has had a tremendous influence on the United Nations through Lucis Trust, which has been tied in with various uh, UN events. And you can get a copy of the World Core Curriculum Manual, which espouses the teachings of Lucis Trust and talks about it in their opening page. You can get them at the UN bookstore in the basement at the United Nations. I was there last fall, and it's true. So again, the spiritual and the political behind the scenes really meld together. But only a small minority of the people supporting this agenda would fall into this category of being Satanists or Luciferians. The fifth motivating factor, and this is the category that by far uh, most of the people in this movement fall into, and that is the religious beliefs of pantheism or those beliefs closely associated with it. Pantheism is really the underlying teaching of the New Age movement. Pantheism also is actually closely associated with the occult and therefore with the teachings of Lucifer and Satanism. And that's why if you go back into the ancient pantheistic mystery religions, many of their high priests worshipped the god of the underworld. And there are references to the god of the underworld same thing as, as, as Satan. So the higher up you get into all these teachings, as Alice Bailey did, she started out studying pantheism and eventually ended up studying the teachings of Lucifer and advocating those. That's where it ultimately ends up. Um, I think it would be worth it this evening to define pantheism. If we can understand what pantheism is and how it works, we'll be able to see through a lot of the spiritual developments today that are taking place in this New Age One World Movement. Pantheism teaches the belief that God is a force. Um, unlike Christianity, which teaches that God is a personal creator, a being that we can communicate with and have personal fellowship with, pantheism teaches that God is a force and that all living things, plants, animals, and human beings, are part of this God force. In a nutshell, all living matter is God, if you put it all together. So we are all part of God, according to this teaching. And there's this divine force that flows through all of us. In ancient Israel, God forbid the Israelites from becoming involved in the religions of the nations around them, which, by the way, happen to be rooted heavily in many pantheistic beliefs. And if you trace those religions back you can make a good case for the fact that they originated in ancient Babylon. And as people spread out from there, they took many of these teachings with them, and wherever the new world civilization sprang up in southeast Europe, the upper Nile region, uh, India, China, Persia, these pantheistic ideas prevailed. They were just slightly different from place to place, but the core teachings were very similar. And some of these uh, empires and, and, and nations that sprang up um, uh, various teachings were, were uh, put forth regarding certain aspects of nature that were worshipped above other areas. In other words, they kind of believed everything was divine. But in Egypt, for example, the people could not have survived without the Nile, without the sun and the moon. And so they began to emulate those above other things and began to worship them. Same thing has happened in India today. So pantheism and polytheism are actually very closely associated with each other. The religions of the East today are rooted in pantheism. Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, all of these Eastern forms of mysticism and religions are rooted in pantheistic thinking. Today's New Age movement is little more than the teachings of the East having come into Western society and really, for the most part, they've caught us off guard. Now, it didn't happen by accident. Uh, during the time of Christ, Jesus, of course, laid out the teachings very clearly. And Christianity began to spread, especially throughout the Mediterranean base uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. And as that happened, many of the ancient mystery religions began to, clum uh, to, to crumble, and they had to take on a new form to be able to promote and carry forward their teachings. And so throughout the Middle Ages, you had secret societies spring up that taught many of these same teachings that prevailed in the among the high priests of these ancient mystery religions, these pantheistic religions. You had various Gnostic sects 
In fact, they became the chief persecutors of the Apostle Paul in the early church. You had various Kabbalistic sects that applied mostly to uh, the Jewish people that were deceived into the area of the occult. You had the Rosicrucian order, the Knights Templar order, ultimately Freemasonry, which has carried a lot of these teachings forward. And I'd say that organization, more than any other, has helped to lay the groundwork for today's New Age movement. Do you know, the people that I've already named, including Blavatsky and Bailey, were both high-level female members of Freemasonry. A lot of people aren't even aware that there's a female side to this as, as well, but there, there is. Much of the, the, the groundwork throughout the 1800s and 1900s was laid by people who were high-ranking Freemasons or were members of other secret societies. But these people People cherish the religions of the East, especially Buddhism and Hinduism, and the mysticism associated with it, and all these teachings. So really, today, that's, that's all that the New Age is. The New Age sounds a lot more pleasant to people that come from a Christian background than blatant Buddhism or Hinduism or Eastern mysticism. Uh, and I think that's one reason it has been so effective in catching on in this country. Today, depending on what statistic you look at, somewhere between 30 and 40 million American adults dabble regularly in the occult or would consider themselves New Agers. In some communities in this country now, you will literally have a higher percentage, percentage of committed New Agers than committed Christians in that area. We had friends of ours who were uh, pastors in um, uh, Michigan just outside of Detroit, and they were in areas totally saturated with this. And once they began taking a stand on it, they found out how many people were involved in this. They found out who their adversaries were on all this, and it was amazing how many were. As history moved, moved along, uh, the push became greater to bring Christians away from Christianity and try to steer them into the area of, of, of the occult. Uh, the Bible makes very clear through many prophecies that in the end times there will be a, a huge unprecedented spiritual deception to the point that even the elect could be deceived if that were possible. And I want to pause here for a moment and take a look at it. just a few of these short uh, scripture references. There are many in the New Testament especially, but just a few of them, uh, beginning with Matthew 24, verses 3 through 5. And this is where Jesus was addressing his disciples as they asked him uh, questions about these matters. Beginning in verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Now think about it. It would be difficult to deceive the elect under the guise of blatant Buddhism, Hinduism, or the name of another religion. But if you come in the name of Christ and put a Christian top dressing over occultic and pantheistic ideas, now you can really confuse people and maybe lure some people in. And that's precisely what's happening today. Again, let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and what Paul had to say about this deception. Verses 9 through 12. It's talking here about the Antichrist, the lawless one. Paul jumps in. He says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Again, the theme here is a huge unprecedented worldwide deception taking place immediately prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ who would put an end to it. And again in 1 Timothy there are references to a last day's deception. 1 Timothy chapter 4 in the first two verses Paul wrote, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
Again, strong words. And there are many other passages of Scripture where those came from, warning us about this end times deception. What I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about specific occult practices that are part of this uh, new age system. We talked a little bit about the doctrine, the pantheism behind it, some of the other motivating factors behind the new age one world movement. Now let's look at a few of the specific uh, practices that are involved and how we as Christians might be able to identify occultic ideas so that we do not fall for them. You need to understand, first of all, that occultic practices, for the most part, are outward manifestations of satanic or pantheistic beliefs. You can actually be a Hindu and embrace the doctrine of pantheism without necessarily involving yourself in occult practices. But usually, if people embrace those doctrines, they go on to embrace the practices that grow out that are the natural result of those beliefs. So most people involved in pantheism also practice certain occult uh, techniques. And that's what I want to focus on, uh, beginning with the whole subject of spirit guides. And I'm sure all of you have heard of spirit guides by now. Fifteen years ago, probably if I would have asked you to raise your hands, one or two of you in this room would have ever heard of a spirit guide. But today, it's a mainstream society. Uh, you hear a lot about it on primetime television, even in the news. They interview people who are communicating with their spirit guides. And this has become quite open in recent years. Now, there are a number of different names that are given to these beings, these spirit guides. New Age occultists often uh, refer to these spirits by names such as instructor, advisor, director, master, enlightened one, adept. Uh, they also talk about a hierarchy of initiates. Uh, there's a German term that's used occasionally, Ebermenschen, which literally means super beings or supermen. And also the custodians of the plan. These beings are referred to as the custodians or caretakers of the plan. So they admit here that there is some kind of plan here behind all of this. The most powerful or highest ranking members of this so-called hierarchy are usually referred to as ascended masters of the wisdom. Sometimes they're just referred to as masters of wisdom or the Tibetan masters. Many New Agers involved in communicating with spirit guides believe that they are headquartered or centered in the area of Tibet, which they believe is the most occultic region on the face of the earth. It's interesting that Hitler brought Tibetan monks to Berlin who were supposed to meditate on his behalf around the clock because he believed this would help give him the victory. He was involved in all of these teachings directly and in, in many of his uh, uh, advisors around him. Obviously, it didn't help him uh, to win the war, uh, but it shows how he was... Uh, inclined toward the occult and what some of his superstitions involved. What are these spirit guides, these ascended masters? How do we explain for this? Um, well, I simply believe they're fallen angels. They're demonic entities. I do believe they exist because I've referred to so many people involved in this kind of activity before becoming Christians. People that I now know I can trust, they're brothers in the Lord, they would not lie about the experiences that they had. They had very real encounters with spiritual beings or entities. Who do these beings claim to be when they communicate with people? Four explanations we've come across. And this depends largely on where a person is at and what they are willing to receive. Satan comes as an angel of light. If you open yourself up to the occult, he's going to study you and know what you are most inclined to believe, and then he's going to approach you from that angle. To people involved in pantheistic belief who would therefore also believe in reincarnation, most frequently, if they're in touch with spirit guides, they would believe that these are former human beings who once walked the earth who have gone through numerous reincarnations and now as a result they have become so highly evolved that they can communicate to us in ways that we cannot yet comprehend that's their explanation of course if you believe in reincarnation and pantheism that that sounds logical that's what they buy into some people also believe that someday they might be able to be a spirit guide and help govern the progress of the planet if you are not spiritually oriented, if you are an atheist or a humanist, 
but you have dabbled perhaps with self-hypnosis and without realizing it, therefore opened yourself up to the realm of the occult. And suddenly you have an experience that you cannot explain with this being that you see in a type of visionary trance state. More than likely, the explanation you would be willing to accept is that this is a being from another world, an extraterrestrial, that is more highly evolved than we are and therefore can communicate to us in ways that we cannot yet understand. I'm willing to tell you tonight, put myself on the line, that it is not a coincidence that one out of three films coming out today that's a hit deals with the theme of extraterrestrials. I have a friend who's a film producer, a Christian, for many years. He just got out of it uh, about two years ago. And he said that he knew for a fact, and he named some of the film producers by name, who made it a requirement for people to serve on their creative development of the movies to be involved in some form of occult meditation. And these people are then involved in producing these films. Have you ever wondered how anybody could have such a vivid imagination to even come up with some of this stuff? I believe some of this is literally coming across from the realm of the occult. And these people are simply putting in motion what they're seeing and what they're receiving from these beings. In fact, some might even be willing to go that far to admit that, as it's becoming quite open. A third explanation for the existence of these beings and this one would affect people mainly that would come from a Catholic background. If they've dabbled with the occult and opened themselves up, more than likely they would believe that these beings are either patron saints or possibly even Mary appearing to them. But if you uh, talk to people with some of these experiences, they share a lot of the same details that these other people do that think they saw extraterrestrials or spirit guides. And if you come from a Protestant background, this is the fourth category, more than likely, you will believe that these beings are angels. And this is really caught, caught on now. Uh, you go to any bookstore, even some Christian bookstores now, have New Age occultic teachings regarding angels. You have to be careful if you buy a book on angels that it's scriptural. Um, we know of a person out in, in Colorado that grew up in a Christian home and uh, came on to a conference that was there in town being held, a New Age conference. They went and they became convinced that we can, all of us, can get in touch with our angels anytime we want to and that we have different angels guarding over different areas of our lives and all we have to do is go into an altered state of consciousness to summon these angels and they'll communicate to us. And what they didn't realize they were doing was they were opening themselves up to the realm of the occult. But what a deception. And, you know, they may be angels, but they're fallen angels, so it's a, it's a half-truth. Uh, but people are buying into it because they come across uh, so benevolent in, in many instances. How can these beings be summoned? Can they just appear to anybody at any time? Well, I've already tipped you off. Um, going into an altered state of consciousness opens up the gateway to the occult. That's what people need to understand. Uh, because that is a form of spiritism. This is strictly forbidden throughout Scripture. Um, people today don't really understand what spiritism is, so when they read a verse in the Bible, they might not even realize that they're uh, operating in the realm of the occult necessarily. That's why it's so important for pastors at churches uh, in our day and age to explain to people what the occult is so people know what to avoid so that they don't naively slip into it. The, maybe the best way I can describe altered states of consciousness to you and how this works is as follows. I believe that every person, when they are born, has a type of protective shield, invisible as it may be, that God has placed over them to shield them from the realm of the occult. But if people persist, there are techniques that they can employ and use to tap through that protective shield and get directly involved in the occult. And some of these techniques and teachings are literally thousands of years old and go back to ancient Egypt and Babylon. Others are derivatives of those teachings. They've been modified to appeal to modern society more. But it's the same old stuff. And there are many different ways of achieving an altered state of consciousness. On page 37 of my book, The New World Religion, I have a, a chart, a levels of consciousness chart, uh, that shows you how this works in a pictorial fashion. A normal alert state of consciousness is the beta phase, which I hope I'm in right now as I'm sharing with you. Um, but you, when you go into an altered state of consciousness, the first level achieved is the al alpha state. And that's where people begin to have these experiences, and that's the most common state. 
However, some of the most advanced yogis and swamis from India, they can go all the way up to the omega state where your brainwave activity almost comes to a complete stop. If they were examined at that point in time, somebody might literally rule them to be dead. They can almost bring their bodies to a stop, to a standstill through these various meditation uh, techniques. Now, what are some of the uh, occult practices I'm talking about here that can be used to achieve an altered state of consciousness that open people up to the occult? Uh, one of the most popular ones, perhaps the most popular one, is yoga. I'm sure all of us know people practicing yoga. Uh, you can practice yoga in many YMCAs. I've known of people who become Christians at a local church and that following week go to the Y and practice yoga. And they're opening themselves up to the occult. Um, some of you may have heard uh, recently, uh, and I believe it is true, that, that Jane Fonda has become a Christian. Uh, we've checked into that some, and as best as we can determine, I believe that has taken place. However, I also understand, I've been told, and I have not been able to check this out, that she's still teaching yoga. She probably doesn't realize that, and we need to pray for her and others. But at least they're, they're moving in the right direction. But if you've been involved in this stuff, it takes a while to find out what is not of God. And some people, even two or three years afterwards, are amazed what they have to let go of because they didn't realize they were involved in something that is occultic. Again, it's very deceptive. Um, yoga is passed off as an exercise, and there can be some exercise benefits to it, but it's a spiritual exercise first and foremost, and you need to recognize that. Transcendental meditation is the other area. Of course, this became popular back in... Uh, uh, the 1950s, and millions of people in the United States are now practicing TM. These ideas, both of them, yoga and TM, came right out of what? The Eastern religions. This was the first pantheistic invasion aimed at the public masses in the United States to get us off course. In the mid-1800s, I doubt they would have gotten very far. But as we got into the 60s, all of this just exploded. The, the, the groundwork had been laid and things were ripe. Contemplative prayer is, is another one, depending what you mean by that. Um, this is something being practiced more and more in, in Catholic as well as Protestant circles. Um, it really incorporates some of the principles of Buddhism in it. And it's almost like a form of practicing Buddhism in the name of Christ. So you need to be aware of that. It's another import from the Far East. Mind dynamics, which include flotation tanks, among other devices. Are, you, are all of you familiar with flotation tanks? A few of you are. Uh, for those of you who aren't, you go into a room. Most big cities have at least a few places that have flotation tanks. It's like a casket with water in it. And the water is heated to body temperature. You get in there. You take all your clothes off first. Get in there. And within a short time in there, you feel like you're suspended because it's exactly your body temperature. It's as if you're, you're just floating in space. And it's pitch black in there. They close it up. And then they pipe in new age music to help you relax. And it's all aimed at helping you to achieve an altered state of consciousness. Parapsychology, including all forms of, of clairvoyance and other psychic phenomena, tie into this as well. Trans channeling. Uh, you have these uh, channelers going into an altered state. And some people attending the meetings or seances don't necessarily go into an altered state, but they're still participating in this. And that brings me to another point I need to slip in here. Along with these altered states of consciousness, the other main area of the occult is ritual magic. So you can invoke occult deities without going into an altered state by going through certain rituals, some of them quite old and going way back in time. So those are the two pri uh, chief methods of opening up the gateway to the occult. Okay, now moving on, I want to talk a little bit about hypnosis. There are many, many people who have been hypnotized in this country at one time or another. Uh, I had a friend who was a psychologist uh, he practiced hypnosis. Uh, he was a Christian. He did no better at the time. In fact, he was my youth leader for a while growing up in church years ago. And since then, I found out he's completely let go of this because he realizes now uh, how wrong this is. But it's passed off as a science, and that is how it is taught in most of our universities today. So people don't realize this is not a science. It's dealing with spiritual matters. It's amazing to me that the main treatment for multiple personality syndrome 
is to put people into altered states of consciousness, to hypnotize them, which only opens them up further. That is not the solution. Uh, you've probably seen specials by, I think it was 2020 that did one a year or two ago. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it was one of the major evening news magazines. And they showed how these people uh, go through treatments that involved putting them into an altered state of consciousness. And it just isn't going to work in the, in the long term because it's only opening people up more and more. Now, an area that may surprise people, might not. Well, before I go on to this next category, let me share one example of hypnosis, how powerful it is. My wife's niece, who lived in Bern, Indiana, and went to the high school there a few years back, uh, shared a story with us. Uh, a hypnotist, a renowned hypnotist, came to her high school and was allowed to put on a demonstration there. And this man called up about a half a dozen kids or so and decided certain ones of them he'd be able to hypnotize and others he would not be able to for whatever reason, so he sent them back to their seats. Perhaps they were the strongest Christians of the bunch, I don't know, but probably so. And then he proceeded to hypnotize these, these kids. I believe they were juniors in high school at the time. And once they were under, he had them do all kinds of silly things. He had them get, one of them, uh, he had get on, on uh, their hands and knees on the platform, on the stage, and walk around on all fours, barking like a dog and making all kinds of animal sounds. And the kids, of course, thought it was great. They were uh, laughing hysterically. And then he brought that person out of their trance, and they had little or no recollection of what took place. And then he did something else with another person, and, and so on, and entertained this crowd for some time. Well, about a year or so later, the same hypnotist came back to the same school. And without any warning, without having talked to any of the kids he had hypnotized a year earlier, he spoke what is called the trigger word. And these kids, wherever they were sitting in the audience, immediately slumped over in their seats and went into a trance. This was one year later with no warning. And you cannot tell me there's no power in the occult. Now, he went on to explain that he used his powers for, for good reasons, for good causes. But that's, saying, that's like saying that white magic is okay, but black magic isn't. It's both from the realm of the occult. And um, we cannot allow ourselves as Christians to be drawn into these areas and open ourselves up to the occult. But many people are doing so. Another area I want to focus on briefly is mind-altering drugs. LSD, heroin, various mind-altering drugs can help achieve an altered state of consciousness. In fact, similar drugs were used by the ancient philosophers in ancient Greece. We have this documented to help them achieve altered states of consciousness way back then, at which time they would see various uh, spirit uh, apparitions appear to them, and this was part of their uh, rituals in their initiation. It's true. Uh, nothing new under the sun. It's the same old stuff presented in different ways. It's no of Satan's deception. <clears throat> Virtual reality is now being employed to help achieve an altered state of consciousness. I was flying United Airlines uh, several years ago, and in their magazine, they were promoting uh, a form of virtual reality. It's called Zen Meditation. And f what I got from reading the description is that you put these visors on, and then lights will flash, will flash at a synchronized rate inside, and you'll see them inside the glasses. And just by staring into these glasses for five or ten minutes, it'll put you into a trance. Uh, so they're coming up with all kinds of high-tech ways now of achieving altered states to make it easier and easier. Silva mind control. Millions of Americans have gone through silva mind control, which also uh, use, uses various uh, uh, imaginary vision techniques and focusing techniques to achieve an altered state of consciousness. And then you have your stress management seminar. Some of them also introduce people into this area, and the list goes on. Martial arts, you need to be uh, careful with that too, because some of those ideas uh, have come from the East, and some of the concentration techniques are very li uh, close in line with achieving an altered state if you carry it far enough. So it kind of puts you on that track, although not necessarily all the way into it, but I caution people about that, because many Christians are involved in, in the martial arts in the various forms. Um, in fact, you know, something interesting, if you look up the term ninja in your encyclopedia, you know what ninjas were? Ancient occult warrior priests in ancient Japan known for their occult powers. And that's just the starting point. If you really study the roots of the martial arts and where they came from, 
there's a spiritual tie in, a very strong spiritual tie in. Most, it's more than just wrestling uh, or boxing. There's a spiritual connection there. So just uh, look into it on your own as you have time, and I think you'll come to agree with me on that. Well, I think we've, we've covered that area as thoroughly as we can with the time that we have. Um, if all of these ideas are going to affect us in the last days, occult concepts, a pantheistic thinking, this spiritual deception, there are indications in the Bible that this would be worldwide and that it would be part of this end-time global government uh, system. So how can all these religious beliefs be pulled together into a type of world religion or worship system that would prop up this world government? Well, a lot of organizing has gone into that in the last 50 years especially since World War II. We have seen since World War II a growing number of ecumenical and interfaith activities worldwide. I'll take you through just a few of them, um, and this is an oversimplification again. But really, in the post-World War II era, the World Council of Churches played a significant role in getting the ball rolling toward this false sense of unity. And it started out, it looked good at first, until you began to study their statements. And right from the beginning, they made clear that their purpose was to help create the, the religious atmosphere for achieving a new world order. And that's actually in some of their opening statements, references to the new world order and the likes. Somehow, professing Christians had to be brought together into a type of false unity if it was to go any further. If you could somehow unite Christians in thinking by getting them to compromise various beliefs and, and somehow getting them all together through the World Council of Churches, then, perhaps then, you could take Christ Christianity the next step and try to blend it in with the other world religions. So it's a step-by-step -step process. And we have seen that in, in process over the last 50 years, as I've mentioned. 